at a wavelength of 2.6 millimeters. So, you know, here's some uh, in data that uh, was taken with, uh, with Aztec at this telescope in Hawaii. Uh, this is the core of the Orion molecular cloud. Uh, the trapezium uh, sits right around here. Um, and uh, then behind the, uh, the, the uh, H2 region, behind the Orion nebula that's visible, is this giant molecular cloud where a new generation of stars is, is, is forming. Uh, and we're seeing, the, uh, we're seeing the knots in which the new generation is forming. So there's some other instruments that we're building. One thing, uh, it's a very novel receiver, we call it the Redshift receiver, which is, is made for a, a ultra-wide band. Um, uh, it's made basically for searching, uh, looking at distant objects and trying to measure their redshift from the spectral lines that are, that are there, and you need a very wide band system to do that reliably. Uh, this thing has been tested last year. I just I had it updated the slides completely. This has been tested last year, and it's going on the telescope for some final commissioning tests this year. And we have two other receivers, which are uh, still basically in the, uh, in the final development stages and probably won't be ready for a year or so. It's a picture of the redshift receiver that uh, built, again, built in our labs and one of the initial measurements on a, a nearby galaxy, uh, IC342, which is a nearby big, fairly strong uh, galaxy. We're looking at molecular lines from three different, uh, different molecules here, hydrogen cyanide, an ion called HCO plus and something called hydrogen isocyanide, uh, HNC. Um, just as a give you a sense of how the, this is one-sixth of the band of this thing, bandwidth of this thing, and when I started in this business in millimeter astronomy, if you could get a bandwidth that was this big, you were doing very, very well. So things have just changed uh, enormously, technically, in this business. Um, project funding, um, uh, we've spent a lot of money on this project. Uh, I think it's something in the order of $130 million at this point. About 70% of that has come from the country of Mexico. Um, uh, they're, uh, they're pretty serious about seeing this thing uh, finished. We still need more money uh, to complete the telescope and to put it into operation, which is why I spent the last few days in Washington. Um, and of course, uh, when people say, well, when's it going to be done? I say, well, you know, once I've spent this much money, it's going to be done. Uh, so uh, basically, that's what the, but, but we think that it can be put into operation in 2010 at this point, and that uh, over the next, we should be able to get to first light at three millimeters wavelength next year. Um, the observing time is allocated according to the contributions to the project, so, um, so most of the time is going to go to researchers in Mexico, and then we're going to have some uh, fraction of the time on the telescope. Uh, you know, if we can keep it at 25 or 30 percent, uh, that's going to be doing pretty well because it's a very big and powerful telescope. Um, and uh, with our colleagues uh, in astronomy in Mexico, we've, we've identified a few what I'll call big projects that we want to use. Uh, we want to use the LMT to do. Uh, and uh, we're going to be uh, so, you know, uh, and that's, that's the area that the LMT can really excel at is uh, certain kinds of big surveys of the sky. So uh, with that as an introduction, let's uh, now talk a bit about the, the scientific potential of the telescope and give you a little sense of what, uh, uh, what that's all about. So um, as uh, perhaps we hinted with the pictures before, um, one of the things about doing millimeter wave astronomy, in fact, the, you know, the first thing you know, nowadays is we think about astronomy, and this wasn't true when I was, I guess this was a point you used to have to make to students when I was a student, uh, uh, that astronomy was really about more than just looking through optical telescopes and seeing stars, that there was a lot of stuff out there in the universe, and that uh, each wavelength of light that you observe uh, the universe with has something uh, new and unique to tell you. So in the millimeter wave part of the spectrum, the things that we're looking at uh, are primarily these things that are called that are these things that are called molecular clouds. So if you look at uh, the constellation of Orion, for example, uh, I mean, Orion I'm go down here, uh, here in the visible, but here superimposed um, on uh, on this uh, is is a, a map of the carbon monoxide emission. Carbon monoxide is, doesn't have any particular um, special value, except that it's an abundant molecule, uh, and it's 
essentially one of the best molecules uh, uh, missions to use in order to trace out where the molecular, where these clouds of gas and dust are. Um, you find uh, you find these enormous structures. Uh, you know, the brightest spot uh, basically just behind the Orion Nebula, um, and stars are forming uh, within this thing. Um, so, you know, with your millimeter wave eyes, what you're looking at is you're looking at the uh, uh, looking at the densest part forms of the interstellar medium, the clouds of gas and dust, and the clouds of gas and dust that form stars, that form planets, therefore, as part of the star formation. And uh, these are really fascinating objects. Uh, there's something like uh, over 100 uh, known different molecular species in these clouds. So they have a very interesting chemistry that uh, can tell you a lot about uh, the, uh, you know, how, they, uh, how they, their, their origin, the physical conditions within the cloud. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, what, this is one of the areas I study. So, so you know, one of the things that's interesting about all of that is, is thinking about you know, whether or not the composition of these clouds um, is in some way related to the composition of the gas you know, that uh, form the planets and form, form the sun and the planets, and whether you know, somehow the, the molecules we find in the early solar system are related to the molecules that you find in these clouds. And, um, well, anyway, that's, uh, uh, those are all kind of interesting questions, and I, I think the reason it's interesting think about that is that it, it does show how far reaching just millimeter wave uh, observations uh, can be when we look at the big questions in astronomy. So um, these are the big questions in astronomy as, as defined by a, uh, by a National, Science, National Academy of Science committee. Uh, <laughs> so you know, you know, if you want to know what the really important things are, you go to the National Academy of Sciences and they tell you what the committee tells you what they are. Here's, here's the, uh, here are the five things that uh, okay. you'll notice that after number one here, uh, there's a certain, uh, there's a certain, you know, there's a lack of imagination in forming these questions. But, uh, but in any case, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the big ones are, you know, uh, learning about how the universe began and, uh, you know, what the relationship between uh, the, the physics of the early universe uh, is to, to laws of physics today. And learning about uh, the formation and evolution of galaxies, stars, and planets. So, yeah, I had a question about that previous image. Does carbon monoxide have to be like illuminated to emit? Ah, uh, no, no. It's, you're just uh, you're 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 just looking at uh, its natural emission uh, sitting out there in these very very cold gases. Um, you're not looking. You're looking at what's called a um, a rotational transition. So basically, it's light that's given off because the molecule was rotating. So if you don't see anything, then there's no carbon monoxide there. <laughs> well, now we're going to get into a really complicated uh, answer. Um, uh, there's a lot of reasons why there can be a, something there, but you won't see it, right? But, uh, but basically, because you know, normally speaking, yeah, if you don't see it, it's not there. So, so using that carbon monoxide emission is really operationally the way that people define the extent of these clouds um, uh, and everything. Um, you know, there's trick. You know, you know, we're scientists. There's tricky ways you can do. You can hide things and stuff. And people debate that, but but uh, but basically, if you're not seeing it in those pictures, then it's not there. It's real easy. To, it's real easy. One of the reasons that it's a good tracer of the cloud is very easy to excite it so that it will give off photons. Um, so it takes, uh, in rel it can be done where it, the gas can be rel relatively cold, uh, it has to have a minimum density to get it, uh, get it excited, that density is not 